Hi, my name is Mike Gruba, and I have been asked to present to you today on the topic of musculoskeletal ultrasound guided procedures. We have several objectives to our lecture today. I hope to teach you some basic ultrasound terminology and techniques, learn sterile ultrasound procedure technique, review some problem solving that you might use when a procedure is not going quite as you planned. We'll briefly touch on some documentation needs for your procedure and to review the 10 most common ultrasound guided procedures that I do in my clinic. Since ultrasound is new to all of us at one point or another, I thought I would share some helpful tips on how to make ultrasound a more valuable and easier part of your clinical practice. There are three main prerequisites. You have to learn your anatomy, then you have to learn your anatomy again, and get even more familiar with your anatomy. One of my staff at Mayo Clinic used to always tell us residents that we only find what we look for, and of course we only look for what we know. That means that if you don't know the structures you're looking at, you won't know what you found. So you have to know the basics of origins and insertions of the muscles and tendons, but also start learning some of the bony prominences and how all these structures intertwine in a three-dimensional world, which is represented on a two-dimensional ultrasound image. Finally, it's crucial to take your machine home, scan your family, scan yourself, even practice scan your patients. You might be seeing some for neck pain who has a history of a rotator cuff repair. If your machine is booted up and ready to go, you can go ahead and take a quick look at their shoulder even though that's not bothering them at that visit. There are several basic ultrasound terms that you should know and use when you're discussing or describing an ultrasound image. First, we usually describe an image referring to a specific target or tissue and what orientation that tissue is in. So you might say this is a transverse or short axis view of such tendon or you may say it's a longitudinal or long axis view of such tendon. We also use the term echogenicity which describes the relative intensity of an ultrasound image or a structure. So a structure may be hyperechoic compared to its neighboring tissues. Hyperechoic refers to bright or very white signal and usually represents something like bone, metal, or air. Hypoechoic refers to a darker appearance such as fat or muscle. And anechoic refers to a structure that is completely black or absent of color. And this usually would represent a simple joint effusion, cyst, or blood vessel. There are also some very common artifacts that you need to know about. Posterior acoustic shadowing refers to the fact that ultrasound beams cannot penetrate some very highly reflective tissues such as metal, air, or also bone. Since ultrasound can't see through bone, it casts a posterior acoustic shadow and you can't see anything deeper than the, the surface of the bone. On the flip side, there is something called posterior acoustic enhancement. The ultrasound waves can travel very easily through simple fluid and there's no attenuation or loss of ultrasound signal. So the tissues that are deep to the simple fluid cyst or blood vessels may appear more hyperechoic than their neighboring adjacent tissues at the same depth. In this example here we see a transverse view of the first dorsal compartment tendons just above the metacarpal we see the posterior acoustic shadowing of the metacarpal bone. Here we see an anechoic vein and just below that we see there is hyperechoic tissue below it which is much brighter in color than the adjacent neighboring tissue at the same depth. The reason again for this hyperechoic appearance of this tissue is the artifact known as posterior acoustic enhancement. The final artifact is reverberation and something as smooth and parallel with the probe, something like a needle, will show some reverberation of that needle and echoing of the signal on the screen. Now you may have noticed I didn't describe what a nerve would look like under ultrasound and the typical appearance of a nerve is variable. It all depends on what tissues are surrounding it. If you are looking at a transverse view of the median nerve in the forearm, you'll see that it's surrounded by hypoechoic muscle and the nerve appears very hyperechoic. If you scan distally to the wrist crease, 
Now the nerve is surrounded by hyperechoic tendon, and the nerve itself will appear much more hypoechoic than it did in the forearm. The appearance of a tendon is also variable, but not so much because of the surrounding tissues, but because of the angle of the probe in relation to the tendon. Think of the tendon as a very reflective tissue, and if the probe is very parallel with the tendon, then the tendon will appear hyperechoic, but if the probe is not parallel, the ultrasound waves bounce off the tendon and away, and the tendon will appear hypoechoic. This occurs because of the phenomenon known as anisotropy. Anisotropy is sometimes your best friend or your worst enemy when it comes to musculoskeletal ultrasound. Certain structures like a tendon can change its appearance from hyperechoic to anechoic simply by tilting the probe 5 or 10 degrees from parallel to a non-parallel position. Now, anisotropy is helpful when you're trying to differentiate tendons from nerves or identify a tendon. However, when you're in a diagnostic scan of a curved tendon like the supraspinatus at its insertion, anisotropy can play tricks with you. You might see a hypoechoic defect in the tendon that you think is actually a tear, but since you're not parallel with that tendon, it's simply anisotropy, and you don't want to falsely mistake anisotropy for a torn tendon. So you have to take several steps to make sure what you're seeing is in fact a tear and not anisotropy. In this example image here, we see the transverse view of the biceps tendon in its bicipital groove. This is the same tendon on the same patient, and all I simply do is go from having the probe in a parallel position to slightly tilting the probe, and the tendon appears to disappear. This is anisotropy at its best. If you were just looking at the image on the right, you might wonder if the tendon was torn or dislocated from the bicipital groove. And so you have to use tilting of the probe to decide whether or not what you're seeing is actually a real pathology or anisotropy. There are three main probes to choose from with musculoskeletal ultrasound. On the left you see a 15 megahertz linear probe, which will do about 90% of your injections due to its large footprint which gives you a great field of view, and a high frequency, which gives you excellent resolution of the superficial structures. However, if I'm going to be doing a deeper structure, something five or more centimeters below the skin, I prefer to use the middle probe, a curvilinear probe, which is a lower frequency of about six megahertz, and this gives you better resolution of the deeper structures, and also using a curvilinear probe can make deeper injections easier to see. Finally, on the right, you see a very high frequency 16 megahertz hockey stick probe, which is most helpful if you're doing a lot of injections around very prominent bones, like around the medial malleolus or in the wrist and hand. You also want to be able to optimize your image before you do a procedure. This may include choosing the correct probe for the job, adjusting your gain, your depth, the focal zones, and also checking for any Doppler signal in the structures you might be penetrating through the injection plane. You also want to plan to have the target on the opposite side of where the injection is coming from. In this example, the target is this tendinopathic area of hypoechoic tendon, and I intend to have the needle come from the upper right hand corner and come down and enter this area to do a tenotomy. In this image we see a longitudinal view of the patellar tendon. Here is the hyperechoic inferior patella. Distally we see more normal appearing hyperechoic fibrillar pattern of the healthy patellar tendon. And proximally we see a very enlarged and hypoechoic patellar tendon with a lot of increased vascularity or hyperemia which also accompanies tendinopathy. Now seeing your needle can be easier said than done at times. The ultrasound waves propagate in a perpendicular pattern from the probe. Very high reflective objects like a needle re can reflect the ultrasound beams back to the probe which helps generate a very clear image of the needle. However, if the needle is not parallel with the probe, the ultrasound beams bounce away off of the needle and are lost.
and so the needle image is very poor or not at all. There are two main techniques to use when you're doing an ultrasound guided procedure. There is in-plane or long axis approach which describes a procedure where the needle is traveling with the plane of the probe and then there's out of plane or short axis approach which describes a needle which is perpendicular to the probe. Each of these techniques has its positives and negatives but in general you should always try to do the in plane or long axis injections if you're able to. However of course very superficial injections the out of plane approach might be the only approach that's possible. In plane or long axis approach allows you to potentially see the whole length of the needle from where it enters the skin to the needle tip in the target. This is also a much more difficult technique to master as you'll find out because any slight movements of the probe or needle means you will either lose your target or lose your needle or potentially lose both. The key to long axis injection is careful diligence to keep the needle traveling parallel with the probe and keeping the probe anchored to the patient. The angle you take with the needle is according to the depth of the target. And again, the closer you can have the needle to parallel, the easier it will be to see. Deeper injections mean you will have less view of the needle. More superficial injections, like this one, will probably show up like the image here, where the needle is traveling from the upper right-hand corner into the tendon on the left. And if you have the opportunity to make the needle completely parallel with the probe, you'll see the needle very easily, again, as long as the needle is underneath the probe. If you have done any ultrasound guided procedures, you've probably come across what I like to call the disappearing needle. When you first start the in-plane approach, you want to make sure that your needle is in line and aimed perfectly down the, the center of the probe. And as you advance the needle, hopefully you still see the needle in its whole length on the screen. But typically, you might be so focused on the screen that you're looking away from the probe and needle and you may lose the needle or the target image and you get very frustrated very quickly. What I typically say is you have to look back at the patient or needle and this is typically what you see. Although you started completely parallel with the probe, you've veered right or left and you can only see the part of the needle that's under the probe. In this example here, you can see a slight amount of the needle here, but I have no idea whether that is the tip or if this just represents the needle shaft and perhaps the tip is somewhere closer to the patella. So I'm not prepared to inject based on this image. So there are a few steps you can do to help solve this disappearing needle. What I first recommend doing is stop moving the needle. Obviously you don't know where it is, you shouldn't be moving it. Then you can move the transducer slightly to the left or to the right and see if you can find where your needle went. You might find that your needle hand has a tendency to push the needle to the right or to the left unintentionally, and if you can learn this, you can compensate for this in future injections. Typically, though, once you've found your needle, you probably have lost your target on the screen, so you have to start over. Pull the needle back to the surface, reobtain your target image, and make sure that your needle is again completely in line with the probe. You slowly advance the needle keeping it completely parallel with the probe and hopefully you get an image similar to this where you can see the entire length of the needle from the skin entry all the way down to the target tissue. 